Welcome back. We are um, going to continue with the New England colonies. <clears throat> um, we're going to get through Sprite and reinforce that for New England. We're going to talk about Protestant work ethic, Harvard, and Hutchinson, Roger Williams, and separation of church and state. Okay, let's get going. So the first thing I want to share with you is this document. Um, I'm going to teach you how to analyze documents. Hopefully, um, this is called ACAPS. The, the, the approach I'm going to use, it's audience, context, author, purpose, and significance. Okay, so that's just one little paradigm of this that I'm going to share with you. So when you think of a document or when you go to analyze a document, they, you need to put the document in context. That's a really big one. So when you think of a document, I'm going to share with this and this one just to show you. So again, you have an event. Boom, the Mayflower. In, under, in order to understand this completely, and then this could be a document, uh, it could be whatever, event or document, issue, you want to understand what's going on at the time. 1620, what's going on? And then you want to understand what happened before, what preceded this, right? So we have, um, you know, Elizabeth, Bloody Mary, what, what's going on? Remember, you have Bloody Mary and attacking the, the Reformation, 1500s, um, Jamestown, expansion, and then you get what comes after. So it's before, during, which is what's going on at the time, and then after. That is what we call context. So if you can place a document or a, an event within the context of the surrounding events and surrounding atmosphere, then you understand that document pretty well or you understand the context very well. And it, that's one of the functions that you're going to have to be able to do, understanding context. So again, ACAPS. Uh, audience is who is this document aimed at? Who will be reading it? Um, did the author create it with an audience in mind? And so that's a factor. If you can understand the audience, then you understand the document a little bit better. The author is really important. Um, you will, come on, where is it? Ay, caramba. Um, so my pen is having difficulty, but the author, for example, is the author biased? Does he have any notable qualities? If we know who the author, author is, then we gives us insight into the document. Sometimes the author isn't appropriate. Sometimes it's not important. So, but sometimes it tells you everything. So you got to know if you're unclear about analyzing documents, you always look at audience, context, author, purpose, why was the document written? Maybe that gives you insight to the document. Remember, we're trying to understand why this document is important and what, um, what we learn from it. Okay, so m maybe the purpose is significant. And then the bottom line is, why is this document important? What do we learn? How do we use it as evidence of ideas or understanding or messages? So what does this tell us? What do we learn is basically the significance. This tells us that, boom, big idea. All right, so audience, context, author, purpose, significance, A, caps. We're going to be using this the whole year, so try to get it down now. All right, so if we look at this document, we read the headings, etc., read the words, and then kind of look at it. These underwritten names are transported to Virginia, embarked in the Merchant's Hope. That's the name of the ship. Hugh Weston is the master. Okay, so he's the captain. 
who are examined in Mission of Graveshead touching the conformity of the church discipline in England have taken the oaths of allegiance and supremacy. This, um, you don't know if this is important. I'll tell you, it's not really that important. So this is going to Virginia and it doesn't have a date, but we're just going to give you the date. Let's say it's 16, oh, 1610 or 1615. Okay. Now I want you to analyze the data. Look at who's on this ship. Edward, Henry, Richard, Vincent, James, Jonas, Peter, George, Henry, Joe, Thomas, Charles, Joe, William, Joe, Joe, Richard, Francis, Saville, Richard, Richard, uh, Alan, Rowland, Joe, Daniel, Joe, Joe, Edward, Joe, William, Joe, Joe. What do you notice? They're all male names. And then you look at the, the ages, 26, 22, 17, 14. So uh, under 30. Is there anybody over 30? Wow, there's one 29-year-old. Anyone else over 30? Here's a 28-year-old. Oh, here's somebody 40 years old. So it's young men. Here's another one. Here's two 50s. So it's mostly young men, no women, individuals. Where do you think these guys are going? This is probably going to Jamestown. So do you think the development of Jamestown will be different because it's all male? And the answer is yes. That's why uh, the South will have this pattern in the very beginning. Um, and they're going to have a culture. And all that relates to the S, the social aspects of Jamestown. Do you get it? Mostly males, and the culture is going to be different. This one, on the other hand, and take a look at this one. Again, um, ship's list of immigrants bound for New England. John Porty, Porter is the clerk. He's, he's the author of this. So again, uh, audience, context, author, author, purpose, significance. Does the uh, author really make a difference here? No, it's a clerk. The author gives very little insight. Is the context important? It's 1635, so maybe it is. We could put 1635, what's going on before, what's going on during, what's going on after, right? Um, so that may be, you know, 1620. 1635, 1650. So again, that's context. Maybe that tells us something. Oh yeah, this is part of the Great Migration. Remember that? That's going on right here. Plymouth was here. Jamestown was here, 1607. And then what's gonna happen here, um, more development. Indians, maybe, Indian fights. That's what's going to happen. Okay, so we already know that the author, the context may be important. The um, audience, this is some insurance company probably. The purpose, it's a list of people going to the new world. The significance, that's what we're going to see. Is this a significant list? Do we learn anything from this list? And the answer is yes. 1635, Joseph Hull, Agnes Hull, Joan Hull, Joseph Hull, the son, and his son, and his daughter, and his daughter, his daughter, his daughter, his servant. So look at this. This is a family group, the Hull family. Boom. That is a family group, women and children and men. Is that a trend? Is that a pattern? Do you see significance? Yes. Okay. His servant, a clothier. Here's another family, Bernard, Bernard, his son and his son. So there's another family. 
Timothy Tabor. Tabor, Tabor, Tabor. And their servant. And then the Whitmarks family. Get it? So it's families, etc. And that's going to tell you about the Sprite for Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth. This is for sure going to Massachusetts Bay. Um, one more thing, you look at the ages. Joseph Hall is 40 years old and his wife is 25 and then his daughter is 15. What do you learn here? Pay attention to these details. How old was uh, Agnes when Joan was born? Agnes was 10 years old. Did Joseph marry a 10 year old? And the answer is no, it's probably a second wife. <laughs> anyway, I thought you would find that funny. So again, ACAPS, be sure to try to learn and practice analyzing documents. That's very important. Okay, again, uh, mixed economy in New England, no large cash crop like tobacco. There's no tobacco in New England. They were trading lumber, ship stores, building supplies, fish. They do participate in the slave trade, etc. Let's talk about the Protestant work ethic for a minute. Again, when we talk about the pur pilgrims and the Puritans and all that, we start back here in the colonial era. And then we try to make connections to, do we have connections to the pur Protestants here in our time? And so the answer is yes. The, the Protestants will influence our culture greatly. Until about 1880s, we were predominantly a Protestant country. We were fundamentally a Protestant country that relates to the, the pilgrims. Um, the pilgrims in New England is the start of the revolution. And those people who started the revolution were descendants of the Puritans. They have values that are so fundamental to America. Um, independence, re self-reliance, hard work, um, austerity, thrifty, not spending and wasting money, working hard, long hours of work, making a successful life, not being lazy. And that was all part of the Puritan religion. To say you're a good Christian, you go to work. You don't drink, you don't dance, or you drink very little, you, you don't dance. You're very conservative life. You don't waste money. You are monogamous. You have a family, you have a farm. Those are Protestant um, kind of values at that time. And so hard work is one of these con concepts that's ingrained in America. Americans value hard work and we, we really strive to get ahead and so I think that's one connection to the to the pur Puritans one other connection is literacy um, when you remember we're comparing Jamestown and say New England and guess what you're gonna see is here they're gonna focus on literacy they don't care about literacy here they care about money here they're going to be families. Here they're going to be single men. And this is for the first 50 years. Here they're going to be high re highly religious. Here not so much not so much religious like here. They're fanatics. And so when you look at Harvard, you look at it in the context of between Jamestown and New England is that um, Harvard was established to teach the clergy, to teach the, the, um, to educate the religious leaders. So New England is going to be really famous and full of that. All right, let's continue. Anne Hutchinson was an outspoken woman of Massachusetts Bay. One thing with, with the New England economy or New England um, culture is they want conformity. That's kind of like uh, fundamental to religion. They say, um, don't make waves, don't question, you must have faith, you must believe. And th remember, these guys are religious fanatics. 
You know what that means? That means that they um, there's no no compromise if in your religion. If you, you know you're a true believer, anyone says no, it's wrong. You're like no, it's right, and you're wrong. So that's a fundamental conflict. So they demand a lot of uh, conformity. And so, therefore, uh, they are intolerant. The Puritans are not known for being liberal and open. They're known for intolerant, uh, intolerance. So if you didn't cooperate with the Puritans and the, um, the beliefs and the behaviors, it's so interesting to look at um, the legal code, and this would be fun if you want to do this, um, search the laws of Plymouth or Massachusetts Bay. And what you'll see is they're fundamentally um, moral-based laws. You're not allowed to, you know, dance or um, work on Sunday or any of those kind of things. And so um, it was extremely, you know, very strict, very strict um, religious conformity. Well, that brings us to Anne Hutchinson. Well, she was an outspoken woman. Number one, women were not to be outspoken. They had their place, right? They had their place. They had, you know, supporting their husband, you know, very biblical, traditional women's roles. She argued against the clergy. And this has to do with this concept of predestination. And I should have talked about this earlier, but I didn't. Predestination is a um, Calvinist belief that said God has predetermined who is going to heaven and who isn't. Not everybody goes to heaven in the Calvinist belief. God will sort it out and God knows who that you are good. That's one. And there's one more thing. The individual can do nothing to be saved. There's nothing that you can do personally to ensure whether you're going to heaven or not. And, and that's their fundamental belief, predestination. And, and basically... Um, Anne Hutchinson believed this, and so did the Calvinists, and so the Puritans and the Pilgrims. All of them believed this, that only, um, that only these people known as the elect, the elect, are the ones who are, are able to go to heaven. Well, only God knows who the elect are, and there's nothing you can really do. But within, it's kind of complicated, but within this culture... The elect seem to have these characteristics to be good, to be godly, to follow the religious beliefs. And everyone basically believes people who are good, follow the rules, are generally probably elect. Okay. Well, what Anne Hutchinson said was she was criticizing the leaders of the colony and said, wait, you, even though you're part of the clergy, you may not be part of the elect and that you should not have authority. And she was saying, you know, God, she also said God spoke to her. That's problematic, too. She was preaching in her house. She was starting a movement. It was known as the antinomian heresy, especially this part that God spoke to her. That's really what they were complaining about. And then she, on top of it, she was outspoken. She was nonconformist. So all of these things are going on. And they banish her. She um, is, said, you must leave our colony because you're too disruptive. Again, that's an example of intolerance. And I think that's one thing that has to be pointed out. That is part of American culture. We don't tolerate people who are different. At least from the very beginning, we haven't. Uh, tolerated it. So it's something I think that's important. And that brings us to Rhode Island. And Roger Williams is another one of these dissenters or nonconformist. Um, 
And what he ends up doing is he ends up criticizing the leaders of Massachusetts Bay. And he gets exiled. He gets kicked out. And he is most notably known for separation of church and state. He said, civil government should not regulate religious behavior. You should, they, the government should not tell you how to behave in, with religious um, elements. He was um, an agitator, and they kicked him out. He ended up going to Rhode Island, where he will um, buy land from the Indians, and he will have good relations with the Indians, and he will um, be known for separation of church and state. He was almost sent back to England where he was going to be executed by, um, by um, Cromwell, I guess. So anyway, and then can I give you one more thing? I forgot about Anne Hutchinson. Anne Hutchinson ends up uh, going to Rhode Island, and then she goes down to New York where she is killed by the Indians. Isn't that a fun fact? All right, well, I certainly enjoyed uh, working with you in explaining this. I hope you get it. Um, it is complicated, but you have to make sure you know it. All right, thanks a million. Have a great day. Come on. All right, take care. Bye-bye.